The wind is very cold. It is a dry wind, so you can feel electricity in the air. What does that do? You mm. can shake your hand with someone you meet in the street and you have electrical, <laughs> um, what do you say? Yeah, mm -hmm. you get shocked. Yeah, so mm. it can surprise you. That's Sabina Viazzoli, and she's from a place that's famous for its wind, Trieste, Italy. How can you tell when someone is a tourist? Oh, if he or she has an umbrella when we have Bora and rain, this is oh, the first, <laughs> yeah. yes, the first way to recognize someone who is not from Trieste. <laughs> <laughs> it gets broken in a few minutes. <laughs> Trieste is a medieval seaport town located off Italy's northeastern coast, but it is not your typical Italian city. And one of the reasons is it just so happens to sit directly in the path of an intensely cold wind called the Bora. The Bora wind is in some way the superstar in Trieste. I'm Salim Reshamwala, and from TED, this is Far Flung. In each episode, we visit a different location to understand ideas that flow from that place. And today we're talking to people in places where the wind blows strongest and strangest. From Trieste to the Swiss Alps, to Northeastern Spain, to explore how wind not only shapes the physical environment around us, but also the lives of people who live in its path. I'm Sabina, we are now in Trieste and uh, Bora Wind uh, is welcome to us and it's cold. <laughs> I feel like teeny, teeny nails are biting my hands, <laughs> but I can manage. I'm here for you. Sabina offers tours through Trieste, but it's not a typical tour. You are guaranteed to feel something on this because it's a tour about the wind. Sabina sees Trieste like an open-air museum for the Bora. I thought that it would be a very nice way to make people to know my town. And so I invented a sort of a walking tour about the Bora. But even if you visit Trieste on a day when the Bora is not blowing, you can see a lot of strange clues as to how much the wind shapes life there. You'll see how the trees only have leaves on one side, pointing in the direction the wind travels. And there's stones resting on the rooftops to keep roof tiles from blowing off. We can see some you know, very typical Triestine windows. They are uh, very strange. They look like they are pushed out of the building. There are double glasses. And these are windows against Bora. You have to imagine that when people didn't have modern heating and they used to have fire in the kitchen, in the house, to make the house warm. And in a cold day of winter and Bora like this, if you open the window, the temperature will go down very, very soon. There are so many winds in the world. When yeah. people ask you what makes the Bora wind special, what do you tell them? Oh, I tell them that they have to feel it <laughs> because mm. it's a very strong experience. Uh, I love Bora, but after three days of Bora, I say, OK, thank you. You can go away, <laughs> please. <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> so it depends on how long it lasts. <laughs> the Bora affects people in Trieste in all sorts of ways. You even have to plan everyday activities around the wind. Stuff like hanging your laundry. You can also see a lot of strange things like laundry hanging on the branch trees or uh, on the lamp on, in the street because if you hang your laundry out of the window, <laughs> maybe you can lose your socks or your t-shirt and who knows where <laughs> they go. Yeah. So if you're visiting Trieste, you got to literally hold on to your hat as well as anything else that might fly off you. But if you can't go on Sabina's wind tour, you can catch a glimpse of how locals live with and see the Bora. 
in a film shot in the 1950s in Trieste called The Bora Wind. Fin dentro il porto di Trieste la burrasca. Mare canuto di riccioli bianchi rabbuffato dalla bora. È arrivata anche in it, you see the wind just wreaking havoc on the city, like this playful, invisible Godzilla. Imagine old ladies being escorted across public squares by policemen protecting them with their bodies as if they're in a war zone. And pedestrians literally pulling themselves along using ropes strung along the sidewalk. Like they're climbing a steep vertical cliff. Alle svolte fanno vortice. Ci sono stati feriti perfino un treno scoperchiato. And even though the Bora sounds a bit dramatic and scary, people from Trieste have said that part of why they gracefully welcome the Bora is that they think of it as a symbol of strength and hardiness. By enduring the Bora throughout time, it's like a symbolic reminder they can get through anything. All the big, uncomfortable things life throws at you that you can't predict or control. And we talked to a man who's devoted a huge part of his life to celebrating the Bora's two-sided nature. Il vento spira e inspira. The wind blows and gives inspiration. The wind has no borders. This is very important because we live on the same planet. We have to work together. We are all in the same home. That's Rino Lombardi, founder of the Museo del Labora, Trieste's very own wind museum, which he admits is as absurd as it sounds. It's a crazy idea to open a wind museum. Benvenuti. Questa audioguida vi accompagnerà nella visita del complesso museale. Per la descrizione delle opere, premete sulla tastiera il numero corrispondente al punto di vostro interesse e confermate la scelta col tasto play. Museo della Bora, Trieste. Today in Trieste the wind is very strong. It's clear to watch this on the sea because on the sea you can watch a special effect that is called like a smoke effect. The sea become white. The waves are not so high because the wind arrives from the land here and jump into the sea. You can see the effects of the Bora outside, of course. But how do you create an indoor museum about something that's only visible outdoors? For Reno, the wind's invisibility and existence outside of the realities we construct? Well, that's the point. For me, it's important for a metaphoric sense. A bora, for example, is a wind that has no borders. It's important because this wind takes together all the different solo down with the rest of the world. Trieste was originally one of the major seaports of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a vital Mediterranean strategic location. But when Italy became independent, Trieste kind of lost its relevance. Italy has plenty of coastline, so it didn't need Trieste in the same way. But when the Bora blows, Reno says it brings the town vitality and purpose. The wind gives the city a sense of excitement, danger, and drama that it used to embody. Bora is the celebrity of the town. I'm not uh, full of courage. But when there is Bora, I can walk in the town. It's like to go in a spa. You, you catch this energy and then you can do everything. Even something as impossible sounding as opening a wind museum. Everything you find on display there relates to the wind. There's those ropes from the film, recorded and written memories of the wind, books, films, photographs of the aftermath of a strong gust of wind, newspaper clippings, scientific instruments used by wind scholars. And on display, you can also find objects that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see, like an iron. When Reno opened the museum, an elderly woman from Trieste wrote Reno to tell him that her mom used to put an iron in her school bag so that she wouldn't fly away when the wind blew on her walk to school. Yes, in the days with Bora, there is this presence of the wind of the nature in the town. So we find in the town images that are more similar to fantasy than to reality, because we watch things flying, leaves turning like small tornadoes. Things can morph and change quickly. So folks just have to adapt to the uncertainty of not knowing how long or intensely the Bora will blow. Gusts have been recorded as strongly as 180 kilometers per hour, that's more than 110 miles per hour, and can last for days at a time. 
Bridges get shut down, traffic jams start, vendors have to shut down their shops. So wind is something that, like a lot of things in our life, could be bad or be good. But we try to watch the positive part of the wind. The Bora has a wind full of sense of humor. Many locals told us they have a love-hate relationship with the Bora. In Trieste, there's two names for two faces of the Bora. Light Bora, where it leads to a bright sunny day, and Dark Bora, when it brings dark clouds and bone-chilling gusts. Reno says he wants people to come to his museum to appreciate the wind's two-sided nature. For me, it's an invitation to curiosity. And that curiosity about winds led to someone setting out on foot and following them. I love this idea of following something that you couldn't see, something that doesn't really exist, but affects people all the time, and they just don't talk about it or think about it. That's Nick Hunt. He wrote a book called Where the Wild Winds Are, which tracks his journey following four of Europe's legendary winds. So it really came from seeing a map. I'll show you, actually. Nick opened his book and showed me this large map with arrows on it pointing in all directions. The arrows mark weather patterns where the wind blows, and they cross all recognizable borders, countries, continents, mountains, and oceans. And where I just see weather arrows, Nick saw a journey. It was very exciting learning these winds had names and faces and personalities. It made them seem like people that I could meet. They all sound like kind of invitations to a quest. You know, I've been thinking a bit about this story of these two fish who meet and one of them asks the other, how's the water? And the second fish says, what's water? (laughs) And I was thinking about how for us, you know, that metaphor is used to explain many things that we are surrounded by but don't understand. But for us, the air is, of course, the analog to the water. We never think about it except when it moves. And that's wind. And I was curious how you started thinking about it. You know, once you become interested in something, you start seeing it everywhere. Whereas before, I'd be walking down the street, kind of oblivious to what was going on in the atmosphere around me. Suddenly, clouds would be signals. They'd give me clues what was happening. And I'd just become more sensitive to the fluctuations of these currents that blow over our skin and through our hair all the time and affect so many of the things we see. And to understand which wind he was feeling, Nick needed some tools that he could rely on. He had the basics, a compass and an anemometer, a gadget you hold up to the wind to measure its speed, and also one more super lightweight, somewhat unconventional tool. One of the most useful tools you can have is just a little bit of wool just to kind of hold up and see which way the wind's blowing. It's like having a wind sock because a lot of the winds that I was expecting to find were very directional. and You can really tell what kind of wind it is by what direction it's coming from. Out of all the winds Nick met in person, there was one that affected him most intensely. The infamous phone wind in the Swiss Alps. And like the Bora, the phone has a split personality. It's associated with the coming of spring, the the flowers coming out on the alpine meadows, and this sort of picture-perfect blue sky and very clear light. But it's also associated with profoundly negative feelings and with destruction and fire. I lost count of the number of alpine towns that somewhere would have a plaque about the great fern fire where the town apparently burned to the ground. I don't think I talked to anyone who, if they weren't personally affected, they'd have a sister or an uncle who was. All of these stories made Nick increasingly excited to find the phone. But... The phone is elusive, and he was in this remote mountain village, so getting around was not so easy. He had these graphs and charts with him showing him it was supposed to be blowing, but it just didn't show up. I could feel the anticipation in the air, and people have written about this, the way that the coming of the fern sort of enlivened the senses and everything becomes a bit manic. The next morning, he woke up to the sound of a furious roar. And I looked outside and everything was moving. The trees were whipping back and forth and there were hats flying off people's heads. Everything was disturbed and rubbish was flying through the air. There was dust and it was just this kind of furious energy. And my walk that day took me along the shores of this lake. It looked like the wind was writing on its surface. It's kind of calligraphic swirls and loops, cat's paws they call it, these kind of fan shapes of the wind moving across water. And people were just standing at the lake and staring. You know, it felt like families had kind of come out to see this. 
spectacular event. Did you ever experience the flip side of that wind? Yes, that was the happy encounter. I saw the fern at its kind of playful energy. And the second time, it was deeper in the mountains, in this spectacularly beautiful valley with waterfalls crashing down it. As he was walking through these pine forests, he felt something change. And suddenly I was feeling this warm air blowing in my face. And then very quickly it just intensified. I remember the air feeling quite thick, like I was wading through liquid. Unlike the other winds that came in bursts or gusts, Nick said that the phone he found in the Alps was like an open hose pipe. It was non-stop. One of the first things that was unsettling is feeling a hot wind blowing from what you can see are snow-capped mountains. It just feels wrong. So it's just got this uncanny sense. And then waterfalls being blown upwards, which was also wonderful to see, but wrong as well. It just felt like that's not right. Like a movie where the sound doesn't match the picture. He had found the phone, but instead of turning back, he wanted more. So he set up his tent to ride out the night. I spent the night thinking my tent was going to fall down. It felt like it was being kicked on all sides. And I woke up in the morning and the wind was still blowing. But I just remember thinking, okay, that's enough. I've got what I'm looking for, but it didn't stop. And over the course of that day, I just experienced this kind of sudden profound plunge into deep depression via anxiety sort of bordering on paranoia i just felt awful it was just like going down this kind of spiral my whole reason for being there felt ridiculous you know this book i was trying to write felt like a waste of time nick's whole body felt so weak he says he could barely stand up he just wanted to stay curled up in his tent I saw old sign somewhere saying that if someone is suffering from fern crankite, you should remove them from that, the valley that they're in and take them to the next valley where the wind isn't blowing and they'll quickly recover. The locals have a name for this, phone crankite or phone sickness. So to get out of the phone's path, he crawled down the mountain and caught a train to the next town. And I felt absolutely fine the next day. And it was only then that I thought, ah, okay, that was the wind. That's what everybody has told me happens. <laughs> Insomnia, anxiety, depression, exhaustion. Yeah. It just felt like, oh, my life's terrible. <laughs> That's all I could think. For a traveler, it's a thing to be avoided. But for folks who live in the paths of these winds, you can't just leave town whenever the wind picks up. It's something we kept bumping into when talking to folks. The wind offers a choice to follow the instinctual fight or flight or to surrender. And some say that if you stay, strange things might happen, like maybe a flash of madness or spark of passion or creativity after the break. La tramuntana es el vent que va canviant tot. És un vent fort. Because if you're living in a house and you have three months of at least 100 km an hour wind going up and down, well, shall we say it produces a certain level of madness. You lose yourself in what is a totally natural environment, but it seems unreal. It seems almost impossible it can look quite like that. That's Chris Little talking about the tramuntana. It's a wind that is famous for making the sky this intensely brilliant blue color when it blows. Spanish filmmaker Cesar Pesquera, who co-produced this episode with us, even made a film about it. It takes place in Cadaquez, a kind of postcard-perfect fishing village in the north of Spain that's known for attracting famous artists like Salvador Dali, who lived and painted there for a lot of his life. I think many people probably think that Dali was a great genius. And then they come here and they go, well, actually... Quite a lot of it is because they could already see it. To look into this connection between the winds, madness, and creativity, Cesar introduced me to Dr. Antonio Bulbena, a psychiatrist from Catalonia, Spain. He has a clinical practice and actually treats local patients for wind-related disorders. Luckily for Dr. Bulbena, he says the wind brings out his own cuddly side. 
And uh, well, what better when you are in bed looking at the moon with Tramontana howling and you are just making a good hug with your wife. This is really the best thing. Some people prefer fire, but wind to feel more close to the other people. But for people who are especially sensitive to the weather, Dr. Bulbena believes the wind is not just an annoyance, but that it can actually affect them both physically and psychologically. You are going to be anxious, you are going to have headaches, you are going to feel uncomfortable. I think that the wind, quite like the imagination, will take you towards the dark side. Echoes of Dolly's melted clocks. The wind is something that tells you that you are not in control and something wrong might happen. And then there's the sound. And in fact, in a lot of terror films, they use this sound. You put a howl and then everybody gets prepared to jump. Imagine it's a gloomy evening. You're home alone. A strong wind picks up. You hear the creaking of the walls, the scratch of a branch against your window, this howling wind. And then from behind you, you hear... So it's not just the physical effect, but also the the audio effect of wind. It scares you. This might be very deep in our brain. The main ability of our mind is prediction. This kind of prediction is a very important thing in, in animals. In fact, a lot of fishermen, they take a dog in their ships in order to have the prediction of the weather. The thing is that you have to learn how to understand what the dog is going to tell you. So, as humans, we pay attention to the weather in order to predict a possible threat. Well, we are just nature beings. We are quite away from what animals are prepared to survive in the nature. And therefore, we are really in a very different situation. But sometimes this is not very comfortable. It is a beauty to have these signs that tells you that you are still part of the nature, not just a robot in your house. The wind has so many sides to it. It can be playful, destructive, terrifying. But no matter where it blows, across continents and cultures, it reminds us that everything is interconnected. And that takes us back to the Bora Museum. That's where Reno makes a peculiar request. He asks people from all over the world to send him winds, such as the phone or tramontana, that they capture in whatever container they could find. Jars, bottles, cups, cans, tins, boxes, envelopes, you name it, there's probably a wind in it on display in his museum. And everyone has an idea that is different. We receive a box of a girl, send a small wind, is written. The wind desired to come in this box. The wind was not captured, but was something spontaneous of the wind. Rito claims he's received over 200 winds. Some folks go all out and write detailed labels for their wind, with the wind name, location, speed, direction, and day. His most prized wind? A sneeze in a matchbox, straight from the nose of the French illustrator Olivier Duzou. So how do you capture the wind? Everyone has a system. You can Mm. catch the wind in a different way. For example, you can make like a trap. You know how you do with the mouse. You put the cheese, you put a leaf. (laughs) I put a leaf in a trap. Yes. And And then then the wind will come to that leaf and I can capture the wind that way. I love that. that. And to encourage folks to send him all these winds, Rito offers something in return. Here's Nick. If you send him one of these winds, he sends you a certificate in the post. The very official certificate says that you're an honorary wind ambassador to the Bora Museum. Which wind did you send him? I actually, I I still owe him a helm. (laughs) The helm is a wind that blows in England, where Nick is from. And I got to interrupt to say, this is my favorite debt I have ever heard of. Honestly, I have thought I'll just send him an empty jar and (laughs) just make a nice label. But I can't bring myself to do that. I mean, I feel like he might know if I cheated. I I love what this says about you, that you feel like you want to send him the real wind. I could not help but mention this to Rito. Nick owes you some wind. He says he's going to send you a jar with some wind that he hasn't sent you yet. Yes, I'm I'm waiting. So better relation with Nick. No, no, I'm joking. (laughs) He had thought, you know, maybe I should just send a jar of air. He had been tempted to deceive you, but that he wasn't going to deceive you. He was going to get you the real wind. Tell me what it means to you that people are getting you the real wind when they they could just send you a jar from anywhere. 
you know, is a moment of generosity. So I'm happy when I watch in the post, say, ah, oh, today there is a box. Or maybe they call me from the post office. I go to, to take a, a packet and they say, what is it? There is a, an empty bottle. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's not an empty bottle. This is a, full of wind. So there are two kinds of thinking life. You can think that is uh, like the glass, empty or full. I say it's full of wind, so it's different. <laughs> it's another kind of uh, thinking to life. I try to be positive, optimistic way. So this has been a joy to talk to you. Buon vento, ciao. Rito kept reminding us that the absurdities of the wind are a great reminder not to take ourselves too seriously. And so on an unusually windy day, back home in North Carolina, I decided to claim a spot in Trieste. Mic check. Talking. Here, talking here for a second? Hello. Okay. Hello. Just talking in a normal voice. Hello. That's me and my kids back in January, just after we had gotten a bit of snow. Okay, so we are outside. It is a post-snow breeze. Is there a wind blowing now, you guys? Um, I can feel a little a breeze. Yeah, me too. Do you guys know how to capture wind? Um, do you just like put it in a box? Some people put it in an envelope. Some people put it in a jar. How do you do that? What do you think we can use as bait for the wind? What do you think the wind likes? I don't know. Maybe um, one of the leaves on a small tree. Okay, well, let's try and catch the wind. So, guys, get the bait. Okay, I'll go grab it. Okay, so put it in the box, and guys watch and see when you feel some wind and when you think some might be in the box, and I guess just close it as fast as you can, okay? Okay. What's that? Okay, there's starting to be a breeze around here. Oh yeah, do you think it's time? I think it's time. Okay. I think we caught it. Okay, I'm gonna send this to Italy. And see if it survives. Yeah, we'll see if it makes the trip. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm. Farflung is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise for Ted. Our local producers for this episode are Cesar Pesquera and Mark Sanchez. There are two short films about the winds, Santa Ana and Tramontana, inspired this episode. Our production staff includes Elise Blenner Hesse, Huete Gitana, Sabrina Farhi, Michelle Quint, Jimmy Gutierrez, Ben Ben Chang, and Sammy Case. And with the guidance of Roxanne Highlash and Colin Helms. Our fact checkers are Nicole Bodie and Christian Aparta. Ad stories produced by Transmitter Media. This episode was mixed and sound designed by Elise Blenner Hesse and Paul Schneider. Additional music by Cesar Pesquera. Stainless Steel Sound. Chris Zabriski and Lemon Gua. Additional thank you to Tramontana's film art director, Cristian Lopez, and writer, Caco Mendez, and to everyone we spoke with for this episode, Nick Hunt, Sabina Viasoli, Rino Lombardi, and Dr. Bulbena for your time and expertise. Our executive producer is Eric Newsom. I'm Salim Rushmwala. <laughs>